So we are continuing uh, to the message that we, uh, we, the series we've been going on, talking about the laws of Christ and bringing one or two things. So we are still in Matthew 5. Um, you know, we are still in Matthew 5, just bringing one or two things from the passage. And then, you know, once we finish 5, then we'll progress. Now, one thing that we need to take note of is, you know, these laws of Christ is pretty much how the kingdom of God works. We are, uh, we, we are kingdom citizens. So as he's explaining, he's telling us how the kingdom functions. Praise the Lord. There is one striking statement that I want to make reference to in uh, verse 20, I believe. Verse 20, Matthew 5, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Praise the Lord. And we know Pharisees and scribes were people that were known to keep the law. They were the keepers of the law. And they followed it to the letter. They followed it to the letter. And, you know, and they made it so difficult to others. It became so bothersome unto others. But Jesus says, if your righteousness does not go beyond these people, you have no space. You have no place. You see, that is for us to understand, like I mentioned in passing last time, our righteousness is in Christ. We are not trying to be in right standing. What allows us to be in right standing is because of Christ, is because we are in Christ. Now, being in Christ, we have... Uh, we are part of this kingdom, and then we have to function the way we ought to operate in this kingdom. A good example is uh, the Commonwealth countries, with the exception of Canada, I don't understand why. They drive on one side of the road, I think it's left. But when you go to French colonized countries, you will find that they drive on the other side. And all English speaking countries, you find that they drive on the same side as UK. So they follow the same kind of rule. So what Jesus is telling us, this is how you operate in this kingdom. Praise the Lord. And he's giving us the principles. And that is what we are looking at as the laws of Christ. And it's more of the heart than the actions. Because verse 21, he kind of explains a little bit on it. It says, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject uh, to judgment. So he has pushed it further before. The way they would look at it is you shall not matter they see killing the person, but they can hate the person and finish the person in their heart and it's okay. But Jesus has come to right to put the standard a bit up, but also explaining how the kingdom operates, the kingdom functions. So as the, as kingdom citizen. We cannot hate our brother. We cannot hate our sister. Praise the Lord. Because when you do that, it's like the same as someone who's committing murder. That which you are bringing in your heart, it is as if you have already done it. Praise the Lord. There's another place where Jesus spoke that, you know, you will not commit fornication. But when you look at a woman and think in your mind, you've already done it. You've already sinned. So the standard is higher. And it's, not, it's about the status of our heart. I want to insist on that. Our heart, praise the Lord, is about our heart, not actions. Not actions. It's about what is in our heart. 
and then you do it. We see it, but it comes from the heart. We human beings, we do not see the heart, but God sees the heart. And he will give us the grace in Jesus' name. Now for this morning, the passage I want to focus on is in St. Matthew 5, verse 38 to the end, but I'm not sure if time will permit to get to the end Um, because our time is far much spent. But let's start with verse 38. I will read the Amplified Version because it adds a little bit of some explanations. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Punishment that fits the offense. 39, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person who insults you or violates your, your right. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other towards him also. Simply ignore insignificant insults or trivial losses and do not bother to retaliate. Maintain your, digni- your dignity, uh, your self-respect, and your poise. You know, this is amplified that I'm reading. Verse, uh, verse 38, yeah. Let me see, do I go? Let's stop here first to verse 39. So what is it telling us? You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That was part of the law that they received. If you check uh, Exodus 21 verse 24, it says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Uh, Leviticus 24 verse 20, you know, brings us even more. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he injured the other person, the same must be inflicted on him. Deuteronomy 19, 21, you must show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So this is what the law said. But Jesus says, uh, this is what the law said. This is what the law said. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the, uh, on the right cheek, turn the other towards him. He says, do not take into consideration insults or, you know, small violations against you. Simply ignore insignificant insults or trivial losses, but do not bother to retaliate. Maintain your dignity, your self-respect, your poise. Now, the kingdom of God, the way it works, and the reason he says this is because he says, vengeance is mine. Praise the Lord. Now, we as human beings, we want to retaliate. Praise the Lord. We want to retaliate. Now, when you are a child of God, you know vengeance is bad. You do not want to retaliate, but you wish them bad. Right. You wish wish something bad will happen to them. You know? You, 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 yeah, because you cannot do that. Now, when you wish that and you expect it, indirectly also keep a grudge without knowing it. And he's saying for us that certain things you should not take into consideration. Praise the Lord. Some of us take offense for very small things, trivial things. I, that is why I like Amplified, because Amplified said, the second part, simply ignore insignificant insult or trivial losses. Do not bother to retaliate. 
oh, she didn't greet me in the morning. I've, I've, I've seen people fight because of that. No, each time when you speak to me, your body language does this. So it means this. Therefore, I don't want to do anything with you. That, what did they really do to you? Ah, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You also had the other person, ah, their own attitude is this. So me too, I'm taking my position. When you sit down with the two, there's nothing. Praise the Lord. Do not take, just ignore them. Do not take them into consideration. Do not take them into consideration. Ignore some insults. Praise the Lord. Ignore some insults. You know, Leviticus 19.18, Jesus says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So even the word of God also, rec- not, do not take grudges. And he expects us to behave in that manner. He expects us to behave in that manner. And what I would like to add to this, you have, how do I put it, direct offenses. And you have offenses against the, the law. They are different. Because when I sat down and I was meditating, I found that there's another extreme where someone will clearly violate the law. But you say, because I'm a child of God, you sit down on it. You say, I will not bother with it. It is not what the scripture is talking about. Praise the Lord. It is not what the scripture is talking about. You know, there are times uh, you can be at work. There's an incident that takes place, and it's clearly it's racism. And there's policy about it in your workplace. It is not what God is saying. Ignore. Praise the Lord. Because even for them, as he said, you shall not take vengeance. And that is also part of the law. It is in Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear grudges against the children of your people. But at the same time, in that same line, you have the law that uh, he that kills should also be killed. It's not a one-on-one type of relationship. It is with the government with the institution that God has placed in authority to govern the city, to govern the country. They are the ones to carry that judgment. Not for you to carry it on your hand and do it by yourself. So there is a difference between the two. So even when Jesus says that But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. It it is a one-on-one relation. But I like the way Amplify breaks it down. Who insults you, violates your right, and it goes ahead, simply ignore insignificant insults, trivial losses. Do not bother to retaliate. So there's a clear differentiation. And it's up to us to be able to make the difference. If Sister Grace does not greet me, is that a big problem? Praise the Lord. That one will leave alone. But if I'm driving, somebody else come and hits my car from behind. Let the city, the city has its own rules and laws. They will come and they will decide what needs to be done. So there's a difference between the two. 
Praise the Lord. There's a difference between the two. And the reason why this, you know, some of these all came. You have this story about Lamech. You know, Lamech, he was in Genesis 4, he went and pride himself on how he has killed some people <laughs> and this and that. And then he says, if to say this about uh, Cain, then my own should be two times. He was taking it, he was taking the matter in his own hand. And that is not what is expected from us. It, that is not what is expected from us. Let the law of the city look after the situation and make judgment. And you know, this is a bit hard because when I look at, for example, you know, some of this killing that takes place in US, where the police, there were two. They could handle the person. The person was already down. And they still shoot the person. The person died. I do not understand that. Then again, you have this guy. He's a criminal. He has a gun. Like what happened recently. He's white. He had a gun. But they did not shoot him. They arrested him alive. When I try to mix the two, it does not add up. Praise the Lord. But that's a situation of the state. You go to court, the judgment they will take. You, you, you can't go beyond it and begin to take the matter in your hand. Are we together? Even though clearly there are some injustices, but as children of God, all you can do is to go to the authorities that God has placed in that land for them to address that matter. And the rest you leave unto God. And you make an effort not to keep any grudges for yourself. And you know, the heaviest burden one can carry is unforgiveness. It's a burden you are carrying yourself. And the one that offended you is not carrying anything. Like the common say, unforgiveness is like you are drinking poison and you're expecting the other person to die. If anyone who dies, you. Not the other person. Praise the Lord. And unforgiveness is a source of many sickness and diseases. Go and do research on it. You'll find that a lot of diseases come out, out of unforgiveness. So it is in our best interest to forgive and let go. And what God says is vengeance belongs to him. It belongs to him. The one that will decide for your one-on-one -on -one situation, it is him. At what degree, at what level, and when. Praise the Lord. And when. And when. Not that now you begin to sit and count. Okay, God, I'm waiting for this one to begin to repay. You hear something, you say, ah, 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 ah. I hope it's now that I'm beginning to repay. No. When you find yourself in that state, you are in a state of keeping grudges. Hallelujah. You are in a state of keeping grudges. And the other item I want to bring out here, you know, out of verse 39, is we are called to be peacemakers. Hallelujah. We are called to be peacemakers. Now, when you that is called to be peacemaker, small offense, you carry it big. You show it, everyone sees that, ah, ah, this one is offended. You are failing in your assignment to be a peacemaker. And you know, when Jesus, when he introduced uh, the beatitude, he talked about the peacemakers. Can I find that? Uh, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. They will be called sons of God. That means if you are a subject of conflict, whenever there are meetings, that meeting will end in conflict. That meeting will not have any conclusion. 
People will be, ah, time is, time is gone. Some people will begin even to sleep on the line. You are not deserving the name of being called son of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, so they shall be called sons of God. As children of God, we have the responsibility to be peacemakers and not be picky, not to be offended by small, small things. The kingdom of heaven does not function that way. He doesn't want us to be picky. But he sees everything that we do, and he sees what is happening. And he knows how he is recompensing you. He knows. He's a just God. How many of us believe that God is just? He's a just God. He's a just God. Even in a situation where it looks like you're losing, he's still just. Praise God. This morning I was speaking with somebody. I said, you know what? Our God is always good. And he always blesses us. But there is what we need to do. And there is also what he needs to do. He never fails in what he needs to do. If we are failing, he has done his part. It's just we now expecting him to do our own part. He has done his part. He's never on the end of where you lack to perform. He's God. Praise God. He is God, a spirit, to do anything does not require him any time. Does not require much. And he always does his part. Even in blessing us, he does his part. What is left is for us now to do our own part. Praise the Lord. You see, when we talk about a blessing, sometimes we picture it as a, a box, a gift box that will come to your address. They knock, 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 knock. Sister Grace, here's a gift box. Take. The blessing of God can come to you just as an idea. And you begin to implement that idea. You see how things transform. So how many ideas God gives us? Simple question. Every idea you had from the beginning of the year, actually the beginning of the year is even far, from the beginning of May, did you implement? How many of it? So when you begin to look at that and think, you will see, in fact, we are the ones that delay the manifestation of our own blessing. We are the ones that delays it. He may prompt you, say, you know what? As you are passing this place, go and greet so, so, so. Ah, that person, I've not spoken to them in six months. Last time I called them, they did not answer. You, you get there, I don't feel like, I'll do it tomorrow. You go. You don't know. Maybe when you meet, you meet them, they will say something that will lighten a bulb in your mind and you go implement. Maybe there will be a contact that you will need for your next move. You don't know. So God is good regardless of where, what we are going through. God is good. He never fails in his assignment. He never fails. He always does his part. What is left is us to have the wisdom to implement what he tells us to do per time. That's what is left. That is what is left. But God blesses us, all of us, all of us, all of us. Now, it's very clear, you know, there are a lot of Bible passages um, that come in line with that. And I just want to skip. Let me see what's the time. Okay. Maybe one or two things. Um, then he goes, he goes like verse, we stopped at verse 39. Verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you or take your shirt, let him have your coat also. For 
The Lord repays the offender. The Lord repays the offender. And this passage, it talks about, you know, forbearance. We are to forbear with one another. Praise the Lord. We are to forbear with one another. There are some small, small things we don't need to bother ourselves with. Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, he kind of gives the same uh, uh, advice to the believers. Why do you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? So there are some small, small things you can just look. You see it, but you allow it to pass. Praise the Lord. You just allow it to pass. You just allow it to pass. There are some small, small things that we don't need to, to, to carry with us. We don't need to dwell on them. You see it, just allow it to pass. It's okay. It's not worth the conflict that will come after. You see some conflicts, they cost even more than what you lost. Some conflict costs more. It does, it, it just let it go. Verse 41. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. See, this passage is very interesting because I went to search for it. Uh, I didn't really find a corresponding law that talks about this. But I say, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor, your fellow man, and hate your enemy. But... The Bible says you hate your enemies and love your brother. That's what it says, hate your enemies. Now, on that, um, let me see which passage I want to bring out here. Yes, uh, let me give uh, Psalm 39, 139, what I found that was said by David, but I didn't find anything in Leviticus. I didn't find anything in Leviticus. It says, O Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate me? Shouldn't I despise all those who oppose me? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are mine. But, you see, the interpretation is to love your neighbor. And your neighbor, they consider it as your fellow Jews. And everybody else hate them. Now, when you look at the children of Israel, um, in that time, they will not go through Samaria. Because they did not like them. Jews do not have anything to do with the Samaritans. They didn't want anything to do with them because they were a mix. Praise the Lord. So they didn't want anything to do with them. But they concluded that their neighbor is their fellow brother. But everybody else that is not like them, Gentiles, we need to hate. We need to not consider. Uh, Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5 says, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under his burden, and you would, ref you would refrain from helping it, 
you shall surely help him with it. I like the NLT. The NLT kind of put it straightforward for me. If you come upon your enemy's husk or donkey that are strayed away, take it back to its owner. Five, if you see that donkey of someone who hates you has collapsed under its Lord, do not walk by it. Instead, stop and help. This is what is in the law. But, you know, they flipped it all around to fit our desire. It's easy for us to love the ones that love us. It's easy. It does not cost us much. The ones that hate us, it's hard to love them. But when you see, even the law itself did not say that. But he said, you heard. Jesus said, you heard. But you see that coming back from David. David is the one that made such a statement, which the Pharisees got it, transformed it. But Leviticus 19, 18 is very clear. Do not seek vengeance or bear grudges against any of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. They are loving your neighbor as yourself was an interpretation of your fellow Jew, not everybody else. So you see that even the law expects us to help our enemies. Praise the Lord. Even the law expects us to love our enemies. To love that, those that hate us. To love those that hate us. You see, uh, I heard this story. Very interesting. Because it's true. It's hard to love someone that clearly tells you, I hate you. It's hard. So this man of God, there was one, this person that he went to, you know, a conference for a mix. And then to stand to greet each other, he went towards that person to greet him with an hug. He says, no, no, stay away. I hate you. He says, I, I, he said, no, why, you know, my was like, why do you want to hug me? He says, I love you. He says, no, no, me, I hate you. Stay away. Then he says, okay, but I still love you. Now is an opportunity for me to love someone who hates me. Can I still give you a hug? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But this is what in the kingdom of God is expected of us. And I want to leave us with what Christ says. Uh, probably I'll skip. Uh, you know, we'll, if you go down, uh, let's go to verse 48. Um, uh, let me just read everything. So that you may be the children of your father who is in heaven, who makes his son rise on those who are evil and those who are good and makes the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. 46. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do that. If you greet only your brothers, wishing them God's blessing and peace, what more than others are you doing? Do not even Gentiles do not know the Lord do that. Verse 48, that's where I want to end with us. Therefore, you will be perfect. Therefore, will be perfect, growing in spiritual maturity, both in mind and character, actively integrating God's value into your daily life as your heavenly father is perfect. So this exercise, what I want to bring us is this, spiritual maturity. We all desire spiritual maturity. The way you demonstrate spiritual maturity or you attain to spiritual maturity is by also loving those that hate you. By loving your enemy. By praying for them. Not hating them. Not holding grudges against them. And what I want to add to this is you can do all you want. Quote all the scriptures. Prophesy. Uh, move under great anointing. But if you fail to love 
those that hate you. You fail to love your enemies. You have not attained spiritual maturity. Praise the Lord. You have not attained spiritual maturity. And what I like here is the word perfect. You therefore be, will be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. This word, I want to check the source. Uh, the Greek word is teleos. Am I saying it right? Teleos. T-E-L-E-I-O-S. What's the meaning of the word? Perfect. Having reached its end, complete. By extension, perfect. Definition. Having reached its end, complete. The usage is perfect, complete in all its parts. Full grown or full of age, especially of the completeness of Christian character. So what am I trying to say? This perfect here is when you grow, when you begin to, when you begin to show this love, then you are growing into uh, the fullness, the full capacity as a child of God. You are maturing as a child of God. Praise the Lord. You are maturing as a child of God. You are entering into that realm where you are a mature child of God. Praise the Lord. And we'll see that later on. But you know, Jesus says, he, he, gave, he gave one example about a uh, hairs that is still a child. He will be treated as a servant because he has people that look after him. The time you mature, now you have access to all that belongs to you. So as kingdom citizens, when we get to this level, we unlock the resources and the riches of the kingdom of heaven for us. We are able to access them because we have reached the level of maturity. Shall we bow our head and begin to speak to God? Ask him for his grace. Ask him for his grace. Ask him that you not be a hearer only, you also be a doer. Ask him to help you. Just go ahead and speak to him. Speak to him. Ask him to help you. If by adventure you have any grudges, ask him for the grace to let go. Ask him for the grace to let go. Ask him for the grace to love those that clearly they do not love me. Give me that grace. Help me, O oh Lord. Help me, O oh Lord. Just go ahead and speak to him.